Have you got a place in the main documents there that we like to call the Bible? Can you turn with me to Philippians chapter uh, 3? We're going to continue on with uh, what we started talking about a few weeks ago. We started looking at um, Paul writing to the Philippians, and he, uh, the whole chapter's got a, a bit in it, but I just want to zone in on, on verse 12 to 14 at the moment. And Paul writes this, he says, not that I've already obtained all this. He's gone on and he's talked about his one thing. And, and Paul's one thing was his relationship with Jesus. His one thing was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed into the image of his death. This, this is Paul going, this is my one thing. This is the, the ultimate goal of my life is I just want to know Jesus. Anyone share Paul's goal this morning? I just want to know Jesus. I've known a lot of other things and they just leave me feeling empty. I've known a lot of answers to problems that I thought were the answers and they ended up not being the real answer. I've known a lot of theories. I've known a lot of speculation. I've known a lot of people's opinions and ideas. But at the end of the day, the only thing I know that actually genuinely helps me, brings peace, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit into my life is, is knowing God. Amen? Is knowing and experiencing God. So Paul's very passionate about that. So passionate, in fact, that he uh, had his head removed uh, because he would not deny. And back, all they really had to do was to deny and go, ha, 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 gotcha. <laughs> Been talking about this Jesus guy for years, but ah, just kidding, you know, and turn around and walk away. But these guys would not deny the reality of what they had seen, experienced, and heard. That Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross, buried, and resurrected, and they saw him resurrected, and they went on. And because of that, you and I are sitting here today, and there are literally billions of people around the world that are going to be worshipping Jesus still, 2,000 years after his crucifixion, all because the original witnesses saw it and were so convinced of that reality that they would not deny it even to the point of death. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And that's why we're here today. And Paul was one of those guys that was so convinced. And so Paul says this in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, 40. He says, not that I've already obtained all this. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I don't know Christ the way I want to know him yet. I haven't quite got there, but I'm, I'm going after it. I'm chasing it. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. I was saved from something, but I was saved for something as well. He's saying, I was saved from this, but I was saved for something. Christ took a hold of me for a reason. There's a purpose and a reason. He says, and I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And then he says this, but one thing I do. There's one thing I know. There's one thing that I can unequivocally tell you is true. There's, I mean, I've seen, he says, I've seen healings and miracles. I mean, this is a guy that's preached and written letters and been imprisoned and, 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 and you know, uh, seen all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles. He says, but there's, there's, if I nail it all down, he said, there's really one principle, one thing in this Christian life that I guarantee beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that I've learnt through all of this journey. And he says this, this is the one thing that I know. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heaven winning Christ. He says, I forget what's behind. I'm forgetting what's back there, and I'm straining towards what is ahead. There's something up there, and he says, I'm straining towards that. He says, I'm pressing on toward, not pressing back. I'm pressing on toward the goal to win the prize. The ribbon's up there. I'm running that way. I want to run through that ribbon. I want to win that prize because God's called me to that. He says, one thing I do, he says, I forget what's behind me. I forget what's behind me. So many believers have stopped moving because you can't forget what's behind you. You're still looking at what's behind you. We're still hanging on to what's behind you and what's behind us is hanging on to us. We're linking arms with it and it's slowing us down, pulling us back from everything that God has for us to become and everything that God has called us forward to do. And so a couple of weeks ago, we looked at forgetting past sins. And I don't want to rehash and go over that, but we looked at letting go of things. There's stuff that people have done in the past. And we know we're forgiven. And we know that the blood of Jesus washes us. We know that, but we still feel the sting of that. And we still look back at that. And we kind of still hold ourselves back to that. And we've got to just let go. There just comes a point where we've all got to put on our big people pants and just accept the reality that Jesus Christ has forgiven you even if you don't feel like it, if you have repented and turned and walked away from that thing and embraced the reality of Jesus and not just given him your heart but given him your legs. Because Jesus didn't say to the disciples, uh, give me your heart. He said, follow me. Right? It takes legs to follow 
I, I, I love the idea that Jesus wants your heart. Yes, he does, but he doesn't just want your heart. He wants you. He wants you. He wants to lead us down a whole new way of life because we've been living this way, because we've been brought up this way. Our culture's this way. Our family's this way. Society says this way. And then Jesus comes along and goes, well, I'm going to flip the whole thing around. See, the early church, it says in the book of Acts, that the early church, uh, they went to a particular town and the townspeople said, those guys that have turned the world upside down have come here. In other words, they were doing things very different, weren't they? They were living a flipped lifestyle. It was, they flipped the whole thing up and they were living and walking a different way. They were walking a different way. And that's what we're called to. But for some of us, we struggle to do that because we can't let go of the past. So we talked about letting go of sin last week. This week, I want to move on to another thing that I think we need to let go of. And I'm a little bit trepidatious with this because I don't want people to think I'm being heartless. Everybody who's a regular at Arise here, you do know I have a heart. Good, good, because I do have a heart and I love people. But I, I, sometimes we need a nudge, don't we? Sometimes we need a little bit of a shake. It reminds me of shake and bake, Talladega Nights, anyway. <laughs> Forget the bake, we just need a shake. Sometimes we need to be stirring up a little bit. Jesus didn't mind. Uh, 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 I think sometimes there's this, this thing called, uh, uh, what's it called? Moralistic therapeutic deism. Anyone ever heard that term? Moralistic therapeutic deism. It sort of made its way into the church in the early 2000s, uh, particularly in the, in the culture of young people and youth ministry. And it, it basically uh, turns the whole Christian message into, uh, you just need to learn to be good. God just wants you to be good. And if you're good, good people get into heaven. And so the goal of Christianity is to make you good and to make you ultimately happy. And so, if, so God just wants you to be good and happy. And if good and happy people do good things, and people who do good things get into heaven. I don't know where Jesus fits into any of that, but that's kind of crept in. And there were books written about it that kind of mentioned it and so on. And so Christianity becomes just simply a, a, a methodology for you to become a good person. It's more than that. I don't think that God's highest priority is to make me feel good about myself. If that was the case, I would have never seen my sin in the first place. <laughs> he would have patted me on the back and made me feel good about my sin. I'm sure he could have found some redemptive thing in there. Alan, you're ruining your life. You're going to kill yourself at a young age, but at least you'll be with me quicker. Pat on the back. Well done. But there was nothing redemptive about it because he wants a relationship with me. I was a sinner in need of a saviour. And Jesus was my saviour. And so what I want to talk about today is forgetting the next thing, and that is forgetting past hurts. Forgetting past hurts, those things that have caused us pain and suffering in our life. Now, hands up if you've ever been hurt. Okay, here's the thing. It turns out that apparently it's a universal problem. <laughs> Go figure. I don't care if you live here or in another country, whether you're old, young, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're popular, unpopular, whether you speak in tongues or you don't even believe in that stuff. Guess what? Apparently, we all get hurt. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's just something within humans that, that gives us the capacity not just to experience great joy and love and, oh, isn't this wonderful? But at the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, we can experience pain and disappointment and hurt. And it's a part of life. It's a part of life. I dare say this, it's an unavoidable part of life. And when you come to faith in Jesus, how many, here's another mind bender. When you come to faith in Jesus, since being a Christian, how many of you have been hurt or disappointed? What? You're telling me that the new creation, apparently we are, still gets hurt and offended? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because we're still human. And we're still living here in a body. Now, let me start by saying what I don't mean when I say forgetting past hurts. I'm not talking about letting go of hurt instead of seeking healing for it. If, you, if, if seeing a counsellor or a therapist or psychologist is going to help you, sitting down unpacking, and I know it does, I've done it, I still do it, um, then do that. Can I encourage you to do that? I'm not saying just let it go as if it didn't happen. If you have the possibility and the opportunity to find healing and to find redemption and to find uh, uh, your, your heart being put back together or to find a way through the muck and the hurt and, and the stuff of life. If you have a chance to do that, do it. I'm not saying let it go instead of seeking help. And I'm not talking about letting go of pain simply because you don't want to confront it. Some of us know we've got stuff going on inside of us, so we just push it down and we suppress it, and that's not healthy because you can't suppress hurt and pain forever. It'll find its way out. 
It's either going to find its way out in the way you abuse and treat other people or it'll find its way out in the way you abuse and treat yourself. So I'm not talking about that. We, we need to confront the stuff in our life. It's called humility. Amen? It's called being humble. I, I, am, I am not a finished product, people. I know that shocks some of you and some of you may not want to come back. But in the words of that, I can't remember who sung it, that recent pop song, I've got issues. Wasn't there a song out recently, some woman singing about I've got issues? It's like, duh. We all do. We all got issues, you know. God didn't accept me because I'm issue free. So I'm not talking about just letting go of it because you don't want to confront it. And I'm not talking about letting go of pain as a substitute for the hard work of forgiveness. Some of us, our suffering is because we don't want to forgive. And until we release forgiveness to people or institutions or organisations or, or friends or family that have been a part of that hurt coming into our world, until we release forgiveness, you can forget any kind of therapy. Because you're going to continue to hang on to it and continue to poison yourself until we find a place to release forgiveness. That's been a long journey for me with my upbringing in my childhood, trying to learn to release forgiveness. And I've had to go back and, 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 and at times revisit that space in my life. And keep in mind too, forgiveness is a choice, it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling, it's a choice. It's an act of the will, all right? It's an act of the will. So that's what I'm not talking about. So what I am talking about is this. After all the therapy, after releasing forgiveness, if you still feel the pain... How can you still feel that pain and yet not allow the pain to hold you back? That's what we're talking about, letting go of the pain so that we can continue to move forward. You've experienced pain from a past relationship, so you hold people far enough away that nobody can hurt you again, even though the people you're holding away have no intention of hurting you. You've experienced the pain of starting something new, but it didn't work out. So even though you have some new ideas and opportunities in front of you, you don't step into them because you don't want to fail again even though you may actually succeed at this one. You experienced the pain of believing God for a miracle, but it didn't happen. So now you've lowered your expectation and faith so as to not feel disappointment ever again. Even though God may have a different outcome in store for you this next time around, you don't know. But all these things, this pain, this disappointment, it holds us back from moving forward into God and all the things that God has for us. I know this is a sensitive thought for some people, so I'm very cautious, but depending on what you've been through. But I do believe this, that one day we're all going to stand before God. And if regret was allowed in heaven, and I do not for a second believe there'll be any regret in heaven, but if there was regret in heaven, we would look at the plans and the purposes that God had for us over here, and then we're going to look back at this hurt and this pain, and we're going to say to ourselves, why did I let that hold me back from that? Why did I cling so tightly to that as if that was the, the, the final moment, the end game of my life, and it kept me back from so much more that God had for me here? If there was such a thing as regret in heaven, I believe many of us, when we get there, we'll look and we'll go, I cannot believe that I fought so hard to hang on to that. Or that I didn't take the courageous step of letting go of that. Or I didn't want to do the hard work of dealing with that when all this was on offer from God. When all this was on offer from God. So you don't have to look very hard to see that we live in a world where people actually believe it's possible to create a life where nobody gets hurt, nobody gets offended, no one's disappointed, nobody's ever misunderstood. Nobody gets rejected, we're never ridiculed. We actually believe in it so much that we're, our governments are trying to legislate it, aren't they? They're trying to legislate anything that may offend you, you can't say it anymore. So we'll legislate it out. Why can't you say it? Because it might offend somebody. It might hurt somebody. Somebody might be saddened by it. Somebody might be disappointed. And so we're trying to legislate anything out of society that could possibly offend or hurt or cause rejection or whatever, as if being offended, hurt, or rejected is the worst thing in the world that could possibly happen to you. And as if there's no positive or redemptive aspect to any of those things as well. It's crazy. Uh, I, I, I came across this quote once, and it kind of sums it up a little bit. I don't, couldn't find who said it. But they said this, pain is unavoidable, but suffering is optional. Now, I don't want to take that to an extreme. But I do understand the sentiment very much. Pain is unavoidable. We are all going to have things in our life that cause us pain. But the ongoing suffering, the hanging on to that, the sitting there, playing with it, looking at it, reliving the moment, keeping the feeling alive, giving the pain constant momentum as I move from here to there, we, that is avoidable. That is, that, 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 that is something that's optional. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. And we've all heard stories of people that have had some of the most horrendous things happen in their lives. 
and that have lived with that pain but somehow been able to go, I can't change what happened, but I'm not going to let that control the next step I take into my future and I'm not going to let that hold me back. I'm not going to let that stop me from moving forward into everything that God has called me to be and everything that God has called me to do. We all know the people and the stories. I could stand here all morning and just give you story after story of people, some you've read about, some you've seen their movies on TV. Some are sitting next to you in chairs right now who've had things happen that would have taken somebody else out. Things happen that they could easily go, that's going to become my excuse for the rest of my life, why I can't move forward. But one day you are going to stand before God and he's going to love you and he's going to embrace you and he's going to say, enter into my rest and all that stuff. None of that's going to change. But if there's any regret, you're going to go, I cannot believe. Can't believe it. Mum didn't breastfeed me as a child. And so I blamed the rest of my life on that. Hey? We see it, don't we? You go to court for something they've done wrong. Oh, he wasn't breastfed. Well, okay, <laughs> just don't do it again. Next. I didn't have a great... I, I, my father was present but absent. Wasn't the greatest dad in the world. So that's my excuse now. I'm going to, all my four kids, I'm going to tell them, don't you get dirty at me, blame your pop. It's all his fault. If he had been better, I wouldn't have been so stuffed up and so... Better. I can use that as an excuse, but I chose at some point in my life, I'm not going to use that as an excuse. I'm just going to try to be the best dad I can. I'm going to be imperfect at it, but I'm going to try to do the best I can. I'm not looking back at that. I'm not going to use that as a reason why I can't. I'm not going to use that as a reason why I can't be a great mother. I might, might not be a perfect mother, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to use that as a reason why. Every time I slip up or do something wrong, I'm not going to turn around and go, well, you blame black. Now I'm going to take responsibility and go, you know what, yep, my bad, I shouldn't have done that, da, da, da. please forgive me, let's move on. I'm not going to use all these things in my life as excuses to why I can't move forward and become what God wants me to become and do the things that God wants me to do. Pain is unavoidable, but suffering is optional. Uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, uh, Peter writes this, and uh, he, says, he says, Dear friends, he says, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you. Fiery ordeal, I'm going to say that doesn't sound good. Amen? Whatever it is, he's talking about persecution here in this context, but I would say that fiery ordeal means something, this thing that's coming against you right now doesn't feel good. In other words, it's probably quite painful. And here's what he says. He says, even though this uh, fiery ordeal, this thing has come against you, he says, don't be surprised because pain happens, people. Don't be surprised. Pain happens. And when it comes, if this, this has come and it's testing you as though something strange were happening to you. It's not strange. Pain is inevitable. It's not a strange thing, people. When you get persecuted for your faith, it's not a strange thing. When you get rejected, it's not a strange thing. If somebody doesn't like your opinion, it's not a strange thing. If somebody doesn't like your theology, it's not a strange thing. If somebody doesn't like the way you dress, it's not a strange thing. If somebody doesn't like the way you talk or the food you eat or the way you do your hair or how many nose rings you got, it's not a strange thing. Okay? People just, we're like that. We're humans. And sometimes we don't like things and that's okay. And sometimes we re get rejected and that's okay. He says in verse 13, But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that in their situation, the fiery ordeal was persecution for their faith. And he's saying this, the pain of persecution is unavoidable, but the suffering is optional. Rejoice instead. Rejoice instead. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. Can you imagine writing that to a bunch of people that are suffering this kind of persecution and saying, hey, I know, I know, I know they're about to feed you to a lion, but hey, just rejoice. I think there was a conviction about what they were saying. There was a conviction about the fact that pain is unavoidable, but suffering can be optional. I don't want to spend the rest of my life suffering and miss the beauty of today and the joys that are there for me tomorrow and the great relationships that are going to come up in front of me because I had a bad one once. The person that betrayed me, the person that, 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 that hung me out to dry because of them, I don't want to get to know you or you or you or you or you. And I miss out on all these great things because I'm hanging on to some kind of pain or hurt from the past and it's stopping me moving forward. It's stopping me moving forward. Like Benjamin Button, you're getting younger and shorter and I don't even know if that fits, I just want to say it. In fact, you can sum up the entire book of 1 Peter in this sentence. Peter says to them, look to the future in order to get through the present. Look to the future in order to get through the pain and the suffering of the present. You see, we live in a church age today, unfortunately, where we're buying into the same ethos. This is where I want to go. Every pain, every hurt, every disappointment can and will be totally healed this side of heaven. 
So we end up spending our time and energy seeking inner healing from our past, which I agree with, we need to go after it, instead of following Jesus into the future. Hear what, I, hear what I'm saying? We, we, we spend so much time and energy seeking inner healing from our past and sitting in that thing, seeking inner healing year after year, month after month, instead of following Jesus into the future. What if you don't ever get complete healing? What if the pain and the ping and the pang of that particular thing doesn't go away for you? Are you going to just sit there for the rest of your life? We've turned, we've turned the, the, the mission of Jesus in our life into pure inner therapy. It's just all about making you happy and making you do good things and making you feel good. And so if you're not feeling happy and you're not uh, feeling good and so on, then just, just, just sit there and spend your whole life in therapy and getting therapeutic books and self-help books and make yourself feel good about yourself and so on. Meanwhile, the kingdom of God is advancing and God is doing things. Amen. Meanwhile, God is moving. Meanwhile, there are people that need to hear the good news of Jesus. Meanwhile, there are uh, poor that need to be uh, 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 lifted up and, and helped out of poverty. Meanwhile, there are hungry that need to be fed. Meanwhile, there are naked that need to be clothed. Meanwhile, there are broken hearts that need mending. And Jesus generally doesn't just drop magic fairy dust on people. He uses people like you and me, imperfect hurting people, to put on their, 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 their big girl and big boy pants and go, you know what, yes, that might have sucked back then, but I'm not back then, I'm here, and there's great things up ahead, and Jesus used me. Jesus used me. I was reading Luke chapter 9. I don't want, I'm not going to do it now, but you go back and you read Luke chapter 9 in your own time. And what amazed me about it was some of these guys that hung out with Jesus and some of the stuff that was going on inside them and some of their attitudes, you know. These people don't want to hear what Jesus has to say in Samaria and James and John. So we send down fire from heaven on them, Lord. Jesus like, whoa, whoa, whoa up there, boys. Where's that coming from? You've got anger issues. What's happening? Let's sit down and let's unpack your anger issues. Peter's there going, who do men say I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then we all know that in the very next breath, Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. Dude, where's this all coming from? Who are these people? Who are the founders of this movement? Goodness gracious. Wouldn't get a start in most churches today, would they? Really? It's unreal. They had stuff, but Jesus didn't sit them down trying to just do therapy. He's like, come to me and follow me. Sometimes the healing's found in the following. The healing's found in the movement, not in the sitting. And we just want to sit. I just want to stay there, and God, you make me better. And God says, you know what? You want me to make you better? Come walk with me. Let's, I'll, I'll talk to you, but we're going to walk and talk. Amen? We're going to walk and talk. Jesus says, I'm not sitting on a couch next to you and staying in that place with you. There's too much great things up ahead for you. So if you really want my help, here's what you're going to do. I'm not going to stop and sit where you are. You're going to get up and you're going to start walking with me. You're going to follow me. And I'll work with you, and I'll work in you, but you follow me. You come with me. Let's not turn this thing just into a great big therapy session. And it's creeping into the church. Unfortunately, it's creeping into the church. We're trying to create a world where we can shield people from pain, suffering, rejection, disappointment, etc. What we're actually doing is we're actually stunting one of the, mo the growth of one of the most important uh, things inside of a human being, and that is this thing called resilience. We're stunting resilience. We're taking away any, any form of resistance because if you take away resistance, people don't go strong, do they? Why do, you think, why do you think I'm so buff? I go to a gym, don't I, Camo? No? I even would do my legs. Do you, Camo? <laughs> hey? You don't grow strong without resistance. And whatever causes us pain is a type of resistance, usually. And we just give up and we sit there. You take away anything that offends, hurts, rejects, take that away from society, guess what you're going to have? An unresilient generation. And we're living partly in the fruits of that right now. Unresilient people that get easily offended, easily hurt, and won't move on from it. You've all got to apologise to me. You really offended me, Leslie. You need to say sorry. Make me a coffee and three biscuits. <laughs> no, it's not enough. I want three biscuits and a coffee. You know what I mean? Instead of... Okay, look, you know, when, when I got saved, I had a, a really, I had a troubled relationship with my mother my whole life. And I remember getting saved at 19 in Ballina. And I went off to this organisation called Youth of the Mission in Brisbane. I did this thing called a discipleship training school. And while I'm there, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me and says to me, you know, Alan, when you were young, you were a bit of a bugger and you, 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 you stole money. I used to go to my mother's purse and steal money. I didn't mean to, well, that's not true, I did mean to, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was a kid and I was unsaved and I... So anyway, I, I remember taking money and the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. He said to me, I want you to, 
take, get 50 bucks. So I'm going to give you $50. I want you to put it in an envelope. I want you to send it back to your mother with a letter of repentance. You repent. My mother's not a believer. My, my family are not Christians. I didn't come from any background to do with anything to do with church. So I, but I did it. I love God. And so Jesus said, follow me and do this. So I said, okay. Wrote the letter, put it in, put the 50 bucks in, sent the letter off to my mother. And this was back before email and all that jazz. You actually had to write with these things called pens on this stuff called paper. And you had to fold it and put it in these little things called envelopes and put these little things called stamps on it and drop them at this little place called a post office. And then they would take their time to get it to the other side of the... And then, and then anyway... I get this letter back from my mother, and I'm, I'll tell you what, I was so excited when I saw that envelope from my mother. I thought, this is going to be such a great moment. She is gonna, you know, she's going to uh, apologise, and she's going to say, you know what, Alan, no, no, you weren't that bad. It was really me. I wasn't a great mother, blah, blah, blah. We're going to have this beautiful moment of reconciliation. It's going to be awesome. And I opened up the letter, and Mum goes, oh, yeah, thanks for the money. You really were a bit of a brat, weren't you? And I'm like, what? <laughs> this is not how it was meant to happen, <laughs> you know? What am I going to do? Am I going to get offended at that? Am I going to go right back where I was? Am I going to sit back down here and not move forward? The Holy Spirit said, that's okay. Move on. Let it go. You've done everything you can to make it right. Let it go. Move on. Come on, let's keep walking. And years and years and years of walking with him, I can gladly say today now, while it's still not completely restored, me and my mother have a fairly decent relationship now. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. The word resilience in the Oxford Dictionary means this. It means the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from difficulties. The ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Doesn't that sound like something that human beings need right now? Resilience, brings it, resilience builds in us the capacity to recover from hurt and disappointment. Now, how many of you know that we need to learn to recover from hurt and disappointment? Because we're not going to necessarily find all the healing that we want. I'm 53 years of age and I've still got pain in my life from some things when I was raised that I've done everything I can to reconcile, to deal with. I've had therapies, I've talked and so on. But the pain that's sitting there, the disappointment from it, it's still there. It's still very real to me. But I've got to move forward. I've got to let it go and I've got to go on with life. So resilience builds in us the capacity to recover from hurt and disappointment. Resilience also allows us to spring back into shape when we've been bent out of shape by the things that life throws at us. Has anyone ever been bent out of shape by life? Resilience helps you bounce back into shape. That's the beautiful thing about it. Resilience stops us from allowing the hurts of the past to become excuses for the future. See, I believe that God can heal every hurt. I believe that he can. But my experience is he sometimes doesn't. I believe that God can right every wrong. I believe he can, but my experience is that sometimes he hasn't. I believe that God can restore everything. But my experience is that there are times where he doesn't. And I don't know why. But I do know this, God's good. Amen? Amen. I know that God's good. And I know that life's a gift. And I know that he wants me to keep moving forward. I know that he's calling me onwards and upwards. I know that he's still conforming me. I'm a work in progress. I haven't quite made it yet like Paul. Not that I've arrived, not that I'm there yet, but I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on and I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. I might get the musos back up. We're about to finish up. Got a whole bunch of other things here that I'd love to share, but there's this dude by the name of Mephibosheth. Anyone know Mephibosheth in Second Samuel? Mephibosheth from Lodabar. And no, I'm not speaking in tongues. It's a real man, a real place. <laughs> Mephibosheth is the son of a guy by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan's the son of a man by the name of Saul. Saul hated a man by the name of David, and David was really good mates with a man called Jonathan. So while Saul's trying to kill David, when Saul was king, Saul's son, Jonathan, was really good mates with David. They were really good friends. They had a good relationship. You can read the story in 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. Anyway, at the end of the day, Saul is killed in battle, and Jonathan is also killed. And news gets back to the palace that both Saul and Jonathan are dead and David is coming to reclaim the throne. So what happens is a nurse picks up Mephibosheth, the nanny, and starts running because, well, ultimately he's the next in line for the throne, so let's get him out of here. It says that 
Mephibosheth gets picked up and the nurse starts running. And the nurse trips and drops Mephibosheth. And breaks both his legs. And from that point on, Mephibosheth is laying there both legs for the rest of his life. Rest of his life. Some, sometimes we're hurt because of things we do. Anyone ever been hurt because of something you did? Silly choice. Dumb words you said. Stupid action. Intentional, unintentional. It doesn't matter. Sometimes the pain that we feel in our life is caused by ourselves, and we've got to own it. Sometimes the pain is caused by others. It's got nothing to do with anything you did, just like Mephibosheth. He was just a baby at the time. And this nanny picks him up and in a hurry drops him. It was no fault of his own. And that's life. And we've all got pain from things that we've done, that we brought into our own world. But guess what? We're all carrying pain too from stuff that somebody else has done that was no fault of our own. We didn't choose where to be born, when to be born, who to be born to. We didn't choose the way we were going to be raised. A lot of us didn't choose the places we lived, the friendships we were forced to have. We didn't choose the actions to be forced upon us that were forced upon us. We didn't choose a lot of those things. But they left a mark in this pain. Sometimes we can go through therapy and sometimes we can reconcile and sometimes we can release forgiveness and sometimes we can do the work and sometimes we can come out the other end and it's nothing but a happy memory of healing and redemption and so on. But sometimes we do all that stuff but we still feel the pang and the pain of it. And we know that because you're talking to somebody and they say, oh yeah, Uncle Henry did this. And as soon as they say Uncle Henry, you're trapped again. You feel like that wall goes around you, you're back in the cage. You know, God, do I have to live with this for the rest of my life? Like, I can't go there, I can't do this, I can't say that, I can't be with these people, I can't open myself up to this possibility, I can't accept that opportunity, that invitation, I can't, I can't, I can't, because we're trapped, because we're still being held back by some pain and some hurt from the past. You know, Years later, David says to his crew, you know what, is there anyone left of, of Jonathan's house? Because Jonathan was so good to me and I want to show kindness to somebody from my mate, old mate Jonathan's. Is there anyone out there? And this, one of his people goes, well, actually there is. There's this young kid, Mephibosheth. He's laying me both legs. So they go and get him. And I can only imagine maybe Mephibosheth's thinking, okay, finally caught up with me. I'm gone here. I don't know what's going to happen. But David sends to him and all David wants to do is show kindness to him. And in 2 Samuel 9, 7, David says this to Mephibosheth when he, he's brought into his presence. He says, don't be afraid. He says, for I'll shortly show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I'll restore, you to all, I'll restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always catch this. I want you to catch this. I'm going to restore to you all that, was rest- all that was taken, all that was of your father, I'm going to restore all of that to you. And this is the bit I love. He says, and you will always eat at my table. You're always going to sit at the table of the king and eat. And there's a whole bunch of things that have been restored, but guess what? He still couldn't walk. So some things were restored, but not everything was restored. It's not about what's restored and what's not restored. He got to eat at the king's table every night. Just like you and me. We get to sit at the king's table. Some things in life are restored and some things aren't restored. That's, some of that's out of our control. But we've got to let go. We've got to let go of some of this stuff that's holding us back, trapping us in the past. Let me just very, very quickly, in, in, in two minutes, let me just throw some thoughts at you real quick to help you. If you're sitting here now and you're going, but I can't get over the past. If you can't get over it, then just get past it. If you can't get over it, just get past it. Here are some thoughts, maybe to help you get past it. And then we want to pray for some people this morning. If you feel like the Spirit's speaking to you, we'd love to pray for you this morning. And all we want to pray is this, very simple. God, would you give us the strength and the resilience and the power to get past that which we struggle to feel like we can get over? Amen? So here's here's some thoughts as we lead into that. Firstly, chances are you were hurt by a hurt person. Hurt people hurt people, we know that. Hurt people hurt people. Most people are not intentionally wicked, but most of us are inherently weak. 
We're not intentionally wicked, but we're inherently weak. And we get things wrong, and we fail, and we fall short. And we repeat cycles of maybe what happened to us. We do what we've seen, we do what we know. And we do the best we can with the knowledge we've gotten. Often the knowledge we've got is not good knowledge. So if you've been hurt and you've got a pain from somebody, just think about that. Hurt people hurt people. Secondly, getting past a hurt, choosing to let it go, is not the same as saying okay to the offence. Just because you're choosing to let it go, some people hang on to it because it's almost like if I let it go, people are going to think that I'm saying it was okay. No, they won't. No, they won't. God won't think that. And here's the thing. If somebody, if, if somebody thinks that that's what you're doing when you let go, that's their problem, not yours. You're letting go because you know you've got a great future ahead and you're choosing not to be held back there. Third thought, real quick. We need to learn to accept the undisclosed mystery of God's goodness. God's good when he helps us get over the pain. He's equally as good when he simply helps us get past it. God is good. God is good and there's a mystery to God and we are humans and he is God. And the minute we think we figured him out, we flip the script and we've become God. We will never fully understand God. That's why this is a walk of faith. That's why this is a walk of faith, people. Accept the undisclosed mystery of God's goodness. And finally, the pain won't let go of you until you let go of the pain. You think you're a victim to the pain. I'm telling you now, the pain won't let go of you until you let go of it. You hold the balance of power. There's a lot more inside of us than we think there is. God looked at Gideon. Gideon looked at himself and Gideon said, no, no, no. God said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gideon said, I'm this. And God said, no, you're not, you're this. Sometimes it's a journey for us to agree with God. The church doesn't exist because of man's great faith in God. It exists because of God's great faith in men. That's why we're here. And God's got great faith in you. He knows you can overcome these things. He knows you can let them go and he knows you can move on. Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. This is at the end, people. We're not there yet. And they'll be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And watch this, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. We're not there yet, but there's a day coming where he'll wipe every tear. Right now, we still got tears. There'll be no more death. We're not there yet. There's still going to be death, but there's a day coming. There'll be no more mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Until that old order comes, there will still be crying and mourning and tears and pain in life. And we need to learn to get over it. And if we can't get over it, then we need to learn how to get past it. Because God's got great plans and purposes in the future. Who believes God got, God's got good things in store? You know what I read the other day? I'm going I'm to open it up for, for prayer and, and, and so on. Look, if you need to go, feel free to go. We've got tea and coffee next door through them doors there. Hang around, have a tea and a coffee with us. I think God's got great plans. And I think God needs us to get over. And if we can't get over, he needs us to get past because he wants to do great things. I'm reading a book at the moment, Great Southland Revival. You know what I read in it? Sitting there, my, 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 reading the book on Thursday. And I just about fell off my chair. And I took a photo of the page and I sent it to all the ministers around that I had their phone numbers off, just to encourage everyone. And it just has this one line. In 1905, I think it was, there was a prayer meeting in Lismore with 1,300 people turned up to it. Lismore, we're mentioned in this book of revivals all around the country. 1,300 people turned up in our community to pray and to seek God. I feel, like, I feel like God's stirring something up. And he needs us to be the kind of people that are not looking back. He needs us to be looking forward and go, okay, where do we fit in this, God? What can we do? Who can we love? Who can we reach out to? Where can we share? God's doing something great, amen? Why don't we stand together? <laughs> I'm going to pray for us. These guys are going to lead us in a bit of worship. If you would like prayer, we'd love to pray with you this morning. We're not going to no magic finger dust or anything like that just, we're just crying on God the same God you can cry out to from your chair if you want to if you don't want to come up the front grab someone in the room that you know you came with or whatever or a stranger go hey here's the deal I've got some stuff I'm struggling to get over it but I've got to get past it would you pray for me 
So if you want to come forward for prayer, we'd love to pray for you. If you want to pray for one another, do that. But I just want to open up the front and let's pray. Let's push back on some stuff. Let's make some decisions and some choices by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives this morning to keep moving forward, to press on, to go after and to let go of some of the stuff that's been holding us back for way, way too long. So Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We pray, God, for each person in this place. I pray, Father, as we leave this place this morning, that God, in the next seven days, would you give everyone in this room, give us an opportunity to share your goodness with somebody out there, God. There are people out there that don't know you. There are people out there that are bound, that are in prisons. God, need doors open, need chains broken. There are people out there that need to hear they are loved, that there's a God in heaven that has grace and mercy and compassion for them, God. And who else is going to tell them or show them or lead them if your people don't? So Father, every one of us in this room that call on your name, would you give us a divine opportunity in the next seven days to share the goodness of God with somebody else? there. And Father, for each person that's in here right now, God, I pray, would you give them the power, the strength, the wisdom, and the ability to get past those things that we're struggling to get over, Father. Not just so that we can feel good about ourselves, but because, God, there is a a kingdom that is an operation that cannot be seen in this world right now in the natural. It's a spiritual kingdom, and that kingdom is moving forward. The kingdom of God is suffering violence, and violent people are taking it by force. Those who are pressing in and moving forward with the Lord, making a difference, committed to listening to Jesus, committed to walking with Him, are going to make a difference in this community and in this nation in the days coming. And Lord, we put our hand up and we say, Here are we, God. Use us. Use us in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen, amen.